Was it? Yes, we're recording. That's excellent. So, um, yes, good morning, everybody. It's lovely to be here to be talking about um, Lucy Kent Welsh and the exhibition uh, that opened at the beginning of the month at the Russell Coast Art Gallery, which has been a, a joy to put together. Uh, I was commissioned a couple of years ago by David Messam, who uh, owns the Lucy Kent Welsh estate, to write this new biography of her. And uh, then I approached uh, the museum at Bournemouth to, to talk about uh, an exhibition and they were very, very keen because she is uh, a Bournemouth artist, born and bred in Bournemouth. And ooh, if I just get this right, here we go, get to my, there we go. This is, and then she, Lucy made her name um, in 1897, uh, in her mid late 20s when she exhibited this painting, Cult Hunting in the New Forest at the Royal Academy's summer exhibition. It was this uh, painting that really brought her almost overnight into public recognition, a recognition which would last through until really the start of the Second World War or so, uh, with uh, Lucy exhibiting almost every year at the Royal Academy. So the summer exhibitions as they are today are open to all, as well as the academicians themselves. And Lucy's uh, great hope and expectation would be that she would be elected eventually herself to the Royal Academy. And uh, certainly on the back of this painting, this huge painting, Lucy was only about five feet tall. So you get an ex idea of uh, how, um, how big this picture is. I've put the size there, five feet by 10 feet. And it was bought almost immediately by the Royal Academy and gifted to the newly opened Tate Gallery, becoming one of the one of the first um, paintings in the Tate's collection by a woman. This is Lucy on the left here with her sister, her younger sister, Edith. Lucy was born in Bournemouth in 1869 to a prominent local family. Her father was a solicitor uh, from Poole and they helped uh, found a school in Poole and there was a Kempwell school for many years in, um, in Poole. So a, a wealthy family of uh, dissenters, so uh, Methodists that is, and Lucy and Edith were brought up surrounded by animals. Her unpublished memoir, but which I've drawn on a lot for my book, uh, recorded her, her youthful love of animals, dogs, cats, chickens, and horses. And it would be horses, of course, that would become Lucy's great love. And there's a Wonderful number of these little drawings by young Lucy sent to her father, to her grandfather. And she would later say that she didn't know a time when she hadn't drawn and hadn't drawn horses. And this is clearly attested to in, in these wonderful little drawings. And many, many children love to draw. Uh, it's not so many that continue with this love through their life, but it would be a love affair for Lucy with horses. Uh, neither she nor her sister would ever marry. I think she was far too preoccupied with painting and drawing and riding uh, to ever be much interested in romance. Now, uh, her mother, Lucy's mother would suggest that she go and have drawing lessons. Her father wasn't quite so keen on that idea. He thought uh, she was good enough at drawing as it was. But when Lucy turned 14 or 15, her mother paid for her to have lessons at uh, a local vet's, uh, lessons in anatomy. So she was already learning to draw very well, but she went for a a while to study under uh, a vet studying horse anatomy. And this is a later drawing of hers, probably a, a drawing for teaching her own students how to study the anatomy of the horse. And she was certainly one of those artists who did think you couldn't really learn how to draw a living thing properly unless you fully understood the mechanisms inside the bones and the muscles. And from, uh, from uh, studying anatomy, she would continue to draw. She would continue to exhibit her work. Sadly, her father uh, would die when she was still a teenager from tuberculosis, which he had suffered from for, for some years. And she and her mother and her sister would, 
they wouldn't they would certainly not be poor their mother would be able to live on her own resources her income that she had from uh from her her late husband so they went to live in western supermare with some cousins and she was told of a school in bushy in hertfordshire which was uh newly founded but doing very well run by a chap called herkimer and she would uh pursue that as her as her course her direction both her and edith would go back to bournemouth to study at the art school the newly established art school in bournemouth and submit their drawings to herkimer's school and this is lucy in around 1900 1901 painting a picture from the boer war which is in the exhibition at uh, russell coates uh, with this statement of hers horses are to me the breath of life they were really to her everything now it wasn't an easy thing to try and become an artist in the 19th century and certainly not uh, a female artist though things were changing it was becoming more possible the great victorian critic john ruskin uh, famously remarked in a press article in 1875 that he had always said that no woman can paint. Now, Ruskin was the, um, uh, the great mind, the great man of letters of uh, the Victorian e uh, era, and sort of what he said kind of went. But this remark of his that no woman could have painted was actually part of a, a, a longer review of some paintings by Elizabeth Thompson, Lady Butler, where Ruskin admitted that he'd been wrong saying that a woman couldn't paint. And seeing Elizabeth Thompson's work, uh, he changed his mind. This painting was shown at the summer exhibition at the Royal Academy in 1874 and was bought by Queen Victoria and now is in the Royal Collection. And it was Elizabeth Butler who really sort of helped to open the way for women artists in the 19th century. And many women writing about being artists uh, around uh, this period would say that it was this painting in particular that sort of opened, opened the doors for women. Lucy would say she'd never really seen very many paintings until she, she arrived at Herkimer's school and that she was in a way quite ignorant about art. But it was this, this work, this lady, uh, Lady Butler, who, who opened the doors. And it's perhaps uh, certainly most famous to me, but I knew her through this painting, Scotland Forever, from 1881, uh, which I include here because of these charging horses, this wonderful dynamic image where, as in Lucy's painting, um, Colt Hunting in the New Forest, the horses seem to be literally charging out of the canvas at us. It was suggested that Elizabeth Thompson would become the first uh, new woman since the Royal Academy's foundation in 1768 to be uh, elected a, a fellow, an academician. She was um, pipped to the post at the election by Lucy's future teacher, Sir Hubert von Herkimer. Herkimer was born in Germany, but his parents left Germany first to the USA and then came back to Europe and settled in Southampton, which is where Herkimer grew up and Herkimer made a great career for himself as a portrait painter, a Victorian portrait painter. And there's a wonderful painting of his in the Russell Coates collection. It was too large to move to put in uh, the, the gallery exhibition space, but is worth uh, seeking out on the staircase because it is a really marvelous piece of Victorian portrait painting uh, by Herkimer. People may also maybe be familiar with this painting of his on strike. Though uh, Herkimer made his money out of painting portraits, uh, he also was very interested in social conditions in England and painted um, the working class poor around Bushy and Hertfordshire. He also painted this wonderful painting of Bushy, which is where Lucy Kemp Welsh would settle moving to Bushy in around 1892 to study under Herkimer. This painting could almost have been painted from Lucy's front door, the house that she moved to in, um, in um, Bushy, a house called Kingsley, an old, uh, an old inn on the high street. 
And you get a sense of what uh, Bushy was like when she moved there, a very rural, not isolated village. It was only 12 miles from London and there was a railway station just a mile or so down the road. So well connected to London, but still this feel of a country village. This is Lucy's house, Kingsley on the High Street. She would move in there with her sister Edith and they would live there for the rest of their lives together. A uh, beautiful little house, uh, very notable because of the wisteria which still grows up it. Bushy is not quite the same village it once was. It's now um, absorbed into uh, the London conurbation, London between uh, near to Luton, uh, not just not far off the M25 and the A1, and the quiet street that Herkimer painted is now uh, taken over by cars. And that's very relevant to the career of Lucy Kemp Welsh, because obviously she was painting horses and working horses in particular. Uh, an animal that was slowly over the course of Lucy's very long life uh, disappearing from the roads as uh, automobiles took over, something she greatly regretted. Now, Herkimer had moved to Bushy, set up his school there. It would be a, a pretty popular school, no less a figure than Vincent van Gogh uh, even thought of maybe moving to study under Herkimer. Uh, would have been a different sort of reputation for Herkimer's school if he had gone there. He decided to stay where he was in, in Paris. Uh, and Lucy would become uh, Herkimer's most famous student. Herkimer made an absolute fortune from his paintings. He started off in relative poverty in Southampton, uh, but went on to build this house for himself in Bushy, Lululand, named after his second wife. Absolute um, Gothic, Romantic, Germanic, Bavarian extravaganza of a house. Sadly, uh, when Herkimer died in 1914, just before the outbreak of the First World War, the house would be really abandoned and ultimately was demolished just before the Second World War, all that survives today is the, uh, the doorway you see there on the right. But it gives you some sense of the money that could be made by a successful artist in uh, Victorian England. This is one of Herkimer's portraits, Robert Baden Powell. And Powell is important to Lucy's story as well because uh, she would make friends with him and he would gift to her a horse that had been gifted to him by the people of Australia following the Boer War in sort of recognition of Baden Powell's um, service in the, in the Boer War. And this is Lucy standing with that horse, Black Prince, who would be the model in many of her paintings and also uh, the model for Black, uh, Black Beauty when she produced, uh, did illustrations for Black Beauty in 1915. As it happened, uh, Lucy wasn't really madly keen on the thoroughbred horse. She thought thoroughbreds were almost too perfect to paint. She did paint them. Uh, here's uh, two hunters in the orchard at the back of her house in Bushy. Uh, a delightful painting. But it was really the, the working horse that interested Lucy. She found that the working horse had more individuality, more difference, more identity. And you get a sense of the importance of portraiture to Lucy in a painting such as this one, Mixed Company at a Race Meeting, which is included in the exhibition uh, at Russell Coates. Very large painting again, and each horse is different. Each horse is really itself. As Herkimer had uh, taught portraiture, so Lucy had learnt to paint portraits, but hers obviously are portraits of horses. And she was also interested, as um, Herkimer was not quite to the same extent in the social life, the, the poverty and the uh, issues of um, uh, wealth and uh, agricultural poverty in the late 19th century, but still this idea, this focus on the working horse uh, reflects Herkimer's interest in the working man and working families. 
Now, drawing was absolutely at the heart of Lucy's practice, as it was really for any artist in this period. Uh, hours and hours and hours of drawing. Some contemporary critics thought Lucy's paintings were even better than her paintings. And I certainly think um, there's a, 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 an extraordinary sort of life to Lucy's drawings. And every big picture that she worked on was based on endless studies, endless drawings, often very tiny drawings that she would then work up into her often huge canvases. This is a tiny, tiny little pencil study for cult hunting. Lucy would be asked by critics whether she used uh, photographs in her work, and she would say that absolutely not. And when she became a teacher, she would take over Herkimer's school in 1906 when he retired. She would tell her students never to use photographs. This was quite important in this period because a chap called Edward Mybridge, an English photographer who moved to America, had taken a series of photographs, the horse in motion. And I think certainly there is some debt to Mybridge, and Lucy does mention Mybridge uh, in, her, in her notes, uh, that she would almost certainly have seen these photographs, even if she did not work directly from them. She knew, as Mybridge had discovered, uh, the various motions of a galloping horse. But she said it was only, only through study, only through drawing and watching that you could really understand the individuality of the horse and add the artist's expression and emotion and personality uh, to the picture. So here uh, we see this massive work that, that Lucy uh, created and that, that made her name in 1897. She would talk of almost taking photographic snaps in her own mind. And it's possible that she had what we would call today a photographic memory. And she, again, she uses this word snap, snapshot, uh, and that's what she would call her little, her little sketches. She would call them snapshots taken and held in her own mind. Now, just a step back a few years, and Lucy's arrival at Herkimer's school in Bushy, she'd only been there for a few months at most when she saw gypsies driving horses down the high street through Bushy. And she was in the studio uh, learning, studying, when she saw these horses passing by. And she saw at once that it would make an excellent subject for a painting. And she dashed outside, out of, out of her class, uh, carrying the only thing that she could find uh, to paint upon, which turned out to be the lid of her paint box. And this very happily, survives and is in the collection at Russell Coates Art Gallery and is in the exhibition, uh, a very rapid oil paint study of these uh, gypsy uh, horse drovers, which then she worked up into this very large painting. So large, in fact, that she notes in her uh, autobiograph autobiography that um, she had to work with uh, half the picture sticking out of the window. It was too big to, to fit in the little room that she was then using uh, before she moved into her house, Kingsley. She'd eventually, uh, through, her, through her success, be able to build a very large uh, glass studio in the garden at Kingsley uh, to work and large enough to, to bring horses into it so that she could work uh, from life um, with sunlight, but protect, protected from from, um, from the rain and from cold weather. So this was in fact the first painting that Lucy showed at the Royal Academy in its summer exhibition in 1895. To give her the sense of the scale at which Lucy worked is this photograph, her working in 1898 on a painting called To Arms, where she branched out for a short period into history painting, inspired perhaps uh, by Lady Butler's example. These paintings uh, were not a success. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, Herkimer would say that she needed to be working, well, really from life and not sort of branching out into history painting. I mean, these paintings would have obviously been worked up using uh, live horses, but equally clearly they weren't uh, contemporary paintings in the way that um, her earlier paintings at the Royal Academy 
had been. Herkimer advised his students to work in the countryside, to work en plein air, out of doors. And Lucy would come up with a very novel way of doing this, whereby she'd set up her canvases actually wherever she was painting. So she would have a picture as big as this set up in somewhere like the New Forest, put into a special crate with doors so that it could be left out in the open, closed up overnight or if it rained to, be, to protect it, and uh, to be able to work in the very landscape that she was painting. So her, her trees, her flowers, uh, the places are always absolutely accurate, very closely based on the place where she was painting. Very early on, Lucy would be compared and likened to the French painter, Rosa Bonheur, whose painting, uh, The Horse Fair, again on a very large scale, uh, was exhibited in uh, the 1850s in London to great acclaim. And when Rosa Bonheur died in 1899, many uh, press articles would say that Lucy Kemp Welsh was now uh, the new uh, Rosa Bonheur, the woman who was going to be uh, the great 20th century painter of horses. Now Bonheur paints in a, a very almost photorealistic way, which is different from the way that Lucy uh, would develop her painting technique. And you can see as Lucy's career develops the influence of Impressionism upon her. So this is a much softer painting than Bonheur's work, The Harvesters from 1898, currently uh, with uh, Messons in London and for sale again. A beautiful, beautiful painting, the moon rising behind the horses as they head home from their day's labour into the evening sunshine. Uh, a very delicate painting. If one goes to look at uh, a painting that's in the exhibition uh, at the moment from Southampton Art Gallery, Timber Run in the Welsh Hills, one gets an even clearer sense of Lucy's technique and incredible skill with a paintbrush. It can be a difficult thing to transfer drawing skills to painterly skills. And I've been working on a biography of another contemporary of Lucy's, uh, the artist uh, Augustus John, who was very early on a, a great dynamic force as a draftsman, but who struggled for many years to convert his skill in drawing with pencil, crayon, chalk and charcoal into oil painting. Lucy seems very early on to have mastered the technique of oil paint. So to focus in on timber run in the Welsh hills and get really close to the painting, and that's the wonder of having it uh, in the exhibition, is to be able to get so close to these paintings and see near to Lucy's technique and how often the mane of a horse will just be the brush strokes, a quick flick of her brush and she captures uh, the horse's mane. Well, the trees, well, here you go, here you see it, uh, to the left there of the white horse, just these flicks of her brush, the thick sort of impasto of, of the oil paint and um, the really um, incredible little spots of color that she uses. Uh, Certainly a sort of an impressionistic technique that uh, as I say she's mastered very early on and brings to an extraordinary level by this painting in the early 1930s. And you see it again in the, in the trees, which are almost abstract. This is almost something you could have seen in a painting by uh, that great master of painting trees, Paul Nash. And then the figure in the, in the background, there, just a, just a few patches of colour have created that figure. Nothing, you know, no detail at all on his face. He's too far away for that kind of detail. But you can see the axe that he's uh, holding in his hand or the saw. And uh, yeah, again, I think just be able to get close up to these paintings, which are so often so big. And each year for many, many years, Lucy would be producing uh, paintings on a very great grand scale. Uh, and just to see here, just up close, how it's just these Little, little stretches of, of colour that go up to make uh, the bigger painting. And there you mean the figure in the left there, the background is almost lost when you look at the picture up in its um, full scale. 
I said that Lucy never married. This is the closest that she gets to a romantic painting, The Riders, another very large painting up in Sheffield. And it's based on a poem by Robert Browning about a man who's in love with a woman uh, who rejects his proposals of marriage. And he asks her at the end of the poem to go out on, on a ride with her, uh, sort of a last ride together. There is a sort of odd romance there to that, uh, to this painting. Uh, the figure on the on, on Black Prince isn't uh, Lucy, um, but one senses perhaps that something particular to that poem had inspired her to paint this picture. And this one was painted up in Yorkshire. Every summer, Lucy and her sister Edith would travel somewhere, usually around England, Wales, or Scotland. Very occasionally, she went abroad. So far as we know, only twice once to Paris and then once to Italy before, just before the, the First World War. So it was always around Britain really that she was working. And this was, as I say, up in, up in North Yorkshire. And the little photograph there gives you a sense again of the scale at which Lucy worked and produced her paintings. Now uh, this painting uh, was followed not long after by the death of Herkimer in 1914. Lucy by then had taken over his school. She wasn't uh, a great teacher, to be honest. Uh, she really wanted to get on with her own painting. And she said that she only took the school over because it was such an important part of Bushy and the economy of the village that she didn't want to see it closed down. Uh, it kept going uh, until the 1920s. She'd run it for around 20 years. Uh, no really great students at all passed through the school and it, it declined gradually and declined um, quite rapidly uh, with the outbreak of the First World War in 1914. It wasn't long after the outbreak of war that Lucy was invited to uh, produce uh, a enlistment, a, a poster to encourage uh, men to, uh, to join up. Britain was different from France, Germany, Russia, Austria, the other belligerent nations in the First World War, in that uh, in those countries, all men, all young men would, were able to be uh, conscripted immediately into the forces. It was different in Britain until 1916, enlistment was completely voluntary. So posters like this were produced to encourage uh, men to enlist. And this uses again, uh, Baden Powell's horse, Black Prince, as the model, and one of the uh, teachers at the art school as the uh, as the cavalryman. And this again is included in this exhibition, uh, and it was followed uh, very quickly by what must have already been a commission before the war had broken out to produce illustrations for a new edition of Anna Sewell's 1877 novel, Black Beauty. Sometimes thought that the 1915 edition was the first edition of Black Beauty, not the case, uh, but this was, the, I think, the first sort of fully illustrated and colour illustrated edition of Black Beauty, a book that Lucy had received as a present from her father when she was a girl and was, a, I guess, a significant inspiration to her. And it's through Black Beauty that many people have first uh, discovered and come to love Lucy Kemp Welsh's work. And we're lucky enough to have six of the original illustrations for the book in the exhibition. And they make up a beautiful little corner section of the show. And uh, Lucy had illustrated before and Herkimer illustrated books and illustration, book illustration was part of what he taught at the Herkimer School in Bushy. Uh, but it'd been some years since she had accepted any sort of commission. Uh, I think she'd made sufficient money from her paintings that she didn't need to illustrate books anymore. So this was, I think we can suggest from that, um, a particularly important project for her to undertake. With the completion of uh, Black Beauty, Lucy looked to go to France to paint the war. It was the, the great event, the great episode of, the, of her era. She had painted a couple of paintings of the Boer War in the very early 1900s. And now she wanted to go and see the horses, 
see the war, see action, and uh, to be a war artist. The British government was recruiting artists to go to France and Belgium to paint the war, but they were all men. And Lucy struggled to get across to France. She volunteered with the Red Cross. She learned to drive so that she could perhaps drive an ambulance. But she only wanted to go for a brief period, a month or two months at most, to see what was happening, to see it firsthand, and then come back to paint pictures of the war. The Red Cross didn't want to uh, send her out on, on those terms. So in the end, she gave up trying to get abroad, and instead she went to Salisbury Plain to paint uh, the British Army exercising there. And that would result in another epic painting of hers, Forward the Guns. Uh, this was exhibited in 1917 at the Royal Academy Summer Show and was picked out by many critics as the best picture of the war to be seen there at the RA. And it would be bought again by the Royal Academy through uh, Chantry bequest money and gifted to the Tate Gallery. So this gives the impression of being uh, painted at the front. And Lucy did literally again set up her very large canvas on Salisbury Plain. So these horses are under live fire. So you see a shell, well not a shell, but um, uh, an object exploding there in the foreground. It's preparing these horses, these Royal Horse Artillery horses for the Western Front. So it gives the impression of having been painted uh, out there uh, in real conditions. Richard Cork, who has written extensively on British art in this period and on art of the First World War, sees this painting as patriotic. And it is patriotic, it is, it is meant in a encouraging kind of a way. It's not the slaughter of war that you would see in the paintings of war artists like Richard Nevinson or Paul Nash. Uh, and Lucy was very much behind uh, the war effort. She'd been something of a Germanophile before 1914, through her friendship with uh, Herkimer, and Herkimer returned to Germany most summers to holiday. So, and she painted a, a picture for the Kaiser, when the Kaiser was over in London uh, in uh, 1911. Uh, that quickly went out of the window with, uh, with the outbreak of war, and certainly Lucy in her work was showing the war as something uh, as she had in her, uh, her rec recruitment poster, as something to encourage, uh, encouraging uh, young men to go and participate in. The success of this painting would lead to an official commission from the newly established Imperial War Museum. And that would be at Rusley Park in Wiltshire, a remount depot, a place where horses coming over from America, from Canada, from Ireland, were prepared for the war, or injured horses uh, were taken and um, uh, helped to recover. Rusty Park was unusual in that it was one of just a few of these remount depots that was run entirely by women. And just before it closed in early 1919, Lucy went there to paint an official painting. And this would eventually result in this wonderfully designed and articulated painting, The Straw Ride. It's another enormous painting, something like 16 feet across. Sadly, I've never seen it at the Imperial War Museum. It's currently uh, crated away, boxed up and unseen. The War Museum is rehanging its war collection at the moment, and I do hope that they might bring this painting out of storage and allow it to be seen once again. And it was one of the very, very few official paintings carried out by a woman uh, during the course of the First World War. A man was uh, sent, uh, an artist was sent to paint horses at war uh, by the Canadian government. And that man was Alfred Munnings, an almost exact contemporary of Lucy's. He was certainly not as famous as Lucy in 1917. They knew each other. Lucy helped to found a Society of Animal Painters in 1914, and Munnings joined and exhibited with her. Uh, it's said that when he first exhibited at the RA in around 1900, 
Uh, he tried painting a large painting of horses in a style aiming at emulating Lucy Kemp Welsh. He would be commissioned by the Canadians to go to the Western Front and his future fame uh, would rise on the back of those paintings. And he eventually would be elected to the Royal Academy and would become president of the RA and in due course knighted. A career trajectory that could have been Lucy's had she been a man. And it was prejudice against her as a female, as a woman artist, as a woman, uh, that she wasn't sent uh, to France to her disappointment. And she would never be elected to the Royal Academy. And that again would be a great disappointment for her. She would continue to paint through the 1920s. We have a whole section of Lucy's work painting in the circus, and the circus would be a very significant part of her work in the 20s and 30s. Partly, she would say, because horses were becoming rarer to see. Uh, it was becoming harder to have a regular different set of horses to paint. But at the circus, there were endless opportunities to paint. One of her last large paintings, well, in fact, her last large painting would be The Call, painted in 1937. In fact, a year after uh, the last horse-drawn lifeboat launch in Britain had happened, and she had to sort of reconstruct it. And this very large painting is included in this exhibition. Uh, after the Second World War, Lucy's sight declined. She was growing old, too old to follow the circus certainly anymore. And she ceased exhibiting at the Royal Academy in 1948. We have her final RA submission in the exhibition. And she went into decline. Her sister Edith had died during the war in 1941 of cancer. And it's then as her health declines, she stops painting, stops exhibiting, as the horse becomes less and less of a significant part of daily life that Lucy's fame declines. And she dies, not forgotten in 1958, but certainly much overlooked. There's an obituary in the Times, which notes that as tastes in art changed from around 1910 or onwards, Lucy's position as a significant painter declined, but she was, in her day, an equal to uh, Elizabeth Lady Butler. David Messam acquired uh, the Kemp Welsh estate in the early 1970s and set about restoring that reputation that had once been hers, hosting exhibitions, publishing books. And as I said at the start, uh, he commissioned me uh, with this new book, which we launched on the 29th of March to coincide with this exhibition. Uh, and uh, yes, I recommend that book to you alongside the exhibition. The exhibition, as Helen said at the beginning, runs until the 1st of October. We have around 60 to 70 paintings, drawings, pastels, and ephemera from uh, Lucy's life and from her work as, uh, as, part of the, uh, as part of the exhibition. And she's just featured this week on the cover of Country Life with an extensive article about her. And I really think uh, that, that Lucy's time and uh, her, has returned and that uh, once again, her, her significance, her importance is uh, being uh, recognized and understood again. If you're not able to see the exhibition whilst it's in Bournemouth, it is going on to the National Horse Racing Museum in Newmarket. Uh, where it will be from late October until uh, January of 2024. And the National Horse Racing Museum is also where you can see colt hunting on, uh, which is on long-term loan from, uh, from, the, from the Tate Gallery. So a really great chance there as well to catch up the, with the exhibition if you're not able to see it in Bournemouth. But I hope you've uh, received a good introduction to Lucy's work from that. That the exhibition, uh, I've, I've featured some of the paintings in the exhibition, others uh, to supplement the exhibition and give a real extensive idea of Lucy's work and the, the progress development of her career.
Thank you very much. I think I'll return to Helen now, who will hopefully 